episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of our show with another fascinating guest who is helping to uh, create a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Robert Gattenby, who is the chairman of the Department of Radiology at the H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center and co-director of the Cancer Biology and Evolution Program. Uh, Dr. Gattenby spearheaded the formation of a new program at Moffitt entitled Integrative Mathematical Oncology, uh, which brings together the knowledge of applied mathematicians to ultimately collaborate with both tumor biologists and clinical oncologists uh, with the goal of using mathematics that typically developed for other nonlinear dynamical systems uh, to ultimately examine the philosophy, the physiology of tumor, incorporating factors such as phenotype evolution, intracellular communication, as well as the way the tumors interact with various microenvironmental factors, including other therapies. Uh, the program fosters a continuous interaction between mathematicians and experimentalists, and they can form entirely new ther theoretical models as a framework for understanding cancer, its development, progression, and treatment. Uh, this integrative mathematical oncology program represents a really uh, a rethinking uh, of how medical research is done in, in many areas and ultimately providing unique methods that allow the experimentalists, the clinicians to frame the hypothesis and then experiment in silico and identify a variety of first principles that govern both cancer growth and treatment. Uh, Dr. Gattenby aims to make progress using these methods that have been successful in other areas of the physical science for a very long time through this partnership between mathematics, biologists, and clinics. Uh, clinical physicians. Uh, Dr. Gattenby joined Moff in 2008 uh, from University of Arizona, where he's professor in the Department of Radiology and professor in the Department of Applied Mathematics. Uh, he received his bachelor's in bioengineering and mechanical sciences from Princeton and his medical degree from here in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, completed his residency in radiology at, U at UPenn, where he served as chief resident. Uh, Dr. Robert Gattenby, thank you for taking the time to come on the show today. Thanks for having me. It's, it's a real pleasure. Um, typically, you know, we start things off by handing our guests the floor just for a few minutes to, uh, to tell us the, sort of the background story a little more. If, uh, Robert, if you could just sort of take us back to the beginning, uh, where you grew up, how you first got interested in science and, and engineering, and then in medicine, I think that would be a great way to sort of lay the groundwork for everything we're going to be getting into. Um, it's a fairly boring story. I, I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, my, my aunt, when I was very young, my aunt gave me a uh, book on stars and that, that pretty much hooked me into science. Uh, and, I, and I went to Princeton really uh, wanting to do sort of astrophysics and medical physics and um, somehow ended up going to medical school, um, which I hated by the way, um, because medical school was really about memorizing, about uh, being able to sit back related facts as opposed to sort of understanding something that um, I think has been a problem for, for medicine. And I, uh, and I ended up sticking it out and, and, and kind of enjoying my residency. And then, but then when I started working at the Fox Six Cancer Center uh, in Philadelphia after my training, uh, it occurred to me that, that cancer is very much a complex dynamic system. And um, of course, physicists have worked with complex dynamic systems for, for centuries. And typically, these require uh, mathematical models. And the reason is that there, uh, there's a lot of nonlinearities in them. So meaning that, you know, a linear system is you, know, you get x, you get y. If you get 2x, you get 4y. If you get you know, 4x, you get one. That kind of um, uh, uh, linear thinking that, you know, human intuition is really good at. Uh, but when you start to get nonlinearities where, you know, x gives you y, 2x gives you minus 7y, 3x gives you of why um, that's not something the human intu intuition um, goes to, and and I think is uh, what is something that's, that's inhibited the development of cancer uh, treatment, you know, considerably. And if you don't mind, since you're from Philadelphia, I, I always like to tell a Ben Franklin story about Please. how in 1756 uh, he wanted to see a um, a, 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 a lunar eclipse, uh, but a nor'easter blew in, and he couldn't see it, and he was very disappointed, but because, like all scientists of the, that day, he thought that the wind carried the storm, and it came from the northeast, that his brother in Boston would not have been able to see the 
us either. And then he would shock to learn from his brother that the uh, the storm arrived in Boston after the eclipse had ended. Um, and um, it's a classic example of what what seems intuitively obvious. It's, it's, it, you know, the wind carries the storm. It's intuitively obvious and also dead wrong. Um, and he appreciated that. And actually, uh, it was he learned to think about barometric pressure and, and movement in that way. But I think in, in some cancer therapy that what seems perfectly obvious may not be the right approach. So you know, we need as many cancer cells as possible. For example, in a situation where you can't cure the patient, it's probably wrong. Uh, the idea that if we give a little therapy and a response that do just keeping that therapy, you know, at maximum dose until the tumor progresses makes intuitive sense, but I think it's also wrong. Um, and so it's an example of, uh, you know, kind of a warning to everybody, to all of us, that, that um, if, 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 something, if something looks obvious to you, just probably think again. <laughs> Robert, the, you know, I, I was reading um, obviously about your your career and it and it mentioned that, you know, it was back in the 1990s, I think, when you were at Fox Chase, where uh, you began to realize that there was just this uh, incredible amount of data uh, that was being generated um, and we were the beginning of, you know, genomics and proteomics and, and all these other omics, uh, as well as, you know, just talk about linearity. We have all these odd imbalances in oncology where you have the one gene that can yield many different types of cancer and the one cancer that may have many different types of mutations, passenger mutations, drivers, nothing, nothing at, it, it's, it's not that world of here's a mutation, it's yielding this cancer, we know what to hit and we're done. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about sort of this um, data, let's say, this, this, this data portfolio that we have today um, what, what we're sitting on and why we need these new mathematical tools to deal with it. Well, I think that um, you're right. I mean, we've, we, we've generated enormous amounts of data and, and we've, we've siloed uh, what we do so much that um, we, have, we know lots and lots of things about a little bit. Um, we fail to, I think, view uh, tumor in its entirety. So for example, uh, and, and, and so I think evolution provides that kind of framework because there's ecology, there's the environment, and then there's the, the adaption to the, uh, to the environment. Um, and what's interesting is that cancer biologists think that genetics and evolution is the same thing, uh, that evolution occurs because you get patients and, and let's go on. But evolutionary biologists know that evolution occurs because the environment changes, because you start to select for different phenotypic properties, which then are, 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 are um, encoded in, in the genetic. So the genes are the mechanism of inheritance. So they're, they're in some ways the recording of evolution, but they're not the cause of evolution in cancer. And I think because we've mistaken that, that we've talked only about genetics in the absence of the really fundamental dynamics of, uh, of, of um, cancer, which is the phenotype of the tumor and the, and the environmental selection. Um, my, my colleagues and I have actually uh, asked if you were a cancer biologist uh, at a modern day Darwin and you sat in the beagle and you had just volunteers from, from the, the sailors bring you random samples could you have written on the origin of the species and and I would argue that you could not have done it and the, the reason is that what he saw was a common sense thing the, the phenotype of the beak and the, and the size and shape of, of the seed matched um, that is the classic um, and and the genetics underneath that if you just knew the genes you you couldn't see necessarily the phenotype, it's very hard to do that. And you certainly don't see what the selection forces are. And so I think that by failing to, to really understand, the, to, to really have a, a, a what, what physicists always call first principles, um, you know, a fundamental understanding of what's going on. What are the key things that are driving, uh, you know, cancer development? Uh, by simply looking at the genetics, we, we really fail to understand 
the, the big picture. And as long as we keep doing that, we're, we're like the, you know, the, the, the molecular biologists and the people. You know, we're getting data and data and data. We're getting tons and tons of it. But it doesn't really fit together very well. We're taking data that's really probably the most difficult. Whereas all you have to do is look at the damn finch and say that big matches the seed. I mean, it's not that hard, really. Um, but we don't. But we're not looking at it. Um, moving along with those themes, you have you know within your portfolio uh, of 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 interest, you have sort of three categories. Uh, one being the tumor microenvironment and, and its role in, in, uh, in tumor biology, uh, the evolutionary dynamics, which you spoke about, and then this other area well, we'll get into a little later, sort of information flow uh, in living systems. I, I thought we'd start off with uh, tumor microenvironment because you, you've written a lot of papers in this domain. Uh, you've talked about um, things in terms of, uh, obviously, in, you know, uh, inflammation in the microenvironment, uh, there, you know, I saw a paper of yours with regard to um, anesthetics and how uh, sort of xeno substances mm -hmm. can affect it. Obviously, angiogenesis is uh, well. I don't know how hot it is today, but uh, it, it's still a big area. What are some of the important topics from your perspective that you're looking at at Moffitt when we talk about the tumor microenvironment that are, let's say, that the most critical issues that we should be focusing on today uh, in in these in this new thinking. Well, um, a, a lot of, uh, to me, the, the most important thing that we talk about in the microenvironment is therapy. Uh, you know, we introduce the equivalent of predators, you know, cytotoxic drugs or immune cells or something into the, um, in, into the environment. That's a sort of a stepwise change in the environmental selection forces, you know, against the tumor. Um, you know, what we tend to do is to give, you know, massive amounts of, of, uh, of, of drug uh, with the hope of eradicating cancer, and but we rarely succeed in doing that. And uh, and so, um, what are the dynamics that lead to resistance? Because fundamentally, now um, you know we can cure most local tumors, uh, but once tumors spread, once it becomes yep. metastatic, um, we we rarely cure those cancers, and that's not changed in you know hundred years. And we increasingly have drugs that are available, for, for example, in metastatic prostate cancer, initial therapy will, will, will um, essentially um, get the marker, the PSA, down to zero in virtually every man. Um, and yet the, the number of men that are cured by this is easy to remember, it's zero. Um, nobody's good. Great response, and yet we don't get, why don't we get and, and, and this is played out in pretty much every cancer. You know, we've got more and more treatments. Some of them are very, very effective, but uh, they're almost never curative. Uh, and it's because evolution defeats them every time. Um, it's not surprising. There's about a billion cancer cells in every cubic centimeter of tumor. So if you have, you know, 100 grams of tumor, you know, you have 10 times the human population of, of, of cells as a massive population massive environment, you know, the, the probability that you'll have pop, you'll have cells that are resistant to pretty much anything you can give is, is very high. Um, and yet, um, and, and, but we don't think about evolution. You know, we, we do the standard maximum tolerated dose until progression. Yeah. That's the dogma for 50 years. That's been the dogma of oncology. But what we know is that when you apply it that way, what you're doing is eliminating all the sensitive cells. You're applying enormous selection for the resistant cells, and you're removing their competitors. So, so you can keep treating them. They're resistant. And so while you're treating them, they're grow growing. Um, and I think that that's, again, one of those sort of linear thinking in a nonlinear system. Um, and, and, and although it's, uh, it's so embedded in, uh, in, in cancer that it's, I mean, in oncology, it's hard to even get people to think otherwise. Um, I do think that we consider whether that's the best approach, either when we're even trying to control the drug, the, the, the cancer, or cure the cancer. I think in either case, we can bring to bear, uh, you know, complex evolution principles that will make it more likely to get and based on uh, these evolutionary dynamics concepts, 
uh, you have developed uh, in the past the the concept of an adaptive therapy, basically um, studying the uh, approach that uh, a tumor must be continually see mod you know modulated and the therapy sort of tweaked as uh, these. Uh, you've also turned it in different papers, sort of uh, first strike, second strike strategies. Could you talk a little bit about the concept of adaptive therapy? And then also, you know, there's a fascinating analogy I, I just wish you would go into. It's a, it's a great little story uh, in a paper you wrote called Insights from the Ecology of Information to Cancer Control, where you, you tell this sad little story about um, uh, the American heath hen, which I had to look up, which a, a little fun <laughs> fact here. Um, so, some historians believe it is what the pilgrims ate. They did not eat, eat turkey, but... <laughs> Talk about the uh, the heath hand analogy as well, if you would, when you talk about okay. adaptive therapy. Yeah, they're, they're two slightly different things. So adaptive therapy is um, is is sort of like pest management. So it, uh, since the Nixon administration, you've not been allowed to dump large amounts of pesticide on your property. I mean, it's, although, again, it seems appealing, all, all that you do is select for resistance, then they come back, and then you can't control them. So... Um, since the Nixon administration, this idea of integrated pest management has been a kind of standard, which is rather than trying to eradicate the pests, you know you can't eradicate them. You, um, you simply try to control them. And so um, in patients who have, uh, uh, these are, let's say, men with metastatic prostate cancer, which is our, our first trial, what we do is say, um, if we give maximum power rated dose and double reaction, all we've done is we've eliminated the resist the, the sensitive cells we've selected for the resistance, yep. and and um, and and you now allow the resistant cells to proliferate freely because uh, they have no competitor, um, and that's called competitive release. It's well known in, in in evolution. It's about as bad as you could do it. But, I mean, ironically, is that that what the, the standard therapy is probably the least successful strategy. That you can do. Um, so what we do, what, what we've proposed is this idea that um, we give the, the man a little bit of treatment. We, we get the point, get, get the, the PSA, which is the serum marker eye therapy, down to half of the value that it, it was prior to treatment. And then we withdraw therapy. And, and um, the, the tumor grows back, but of course there's no therapy being applied, so there's no selection for resistance. And in general, uh, the sensitive cells are fitter than the resistant cells mm -hmm. because they don't have the molecular machinery of resistance. So in the absence of treatment, the sensitive cells are fitter than the resistant cells, whereas in the presence of treatment, it's the, the rear. Because you're killing off the sensitive cells. So you, you withdraw therapy, you let the tumor grow back up, but since you're not applying any, um, any uh, therapy, you're, you're allowing the sensitive cells to grow. They suppress the growth of the resistant population. And when you come back to the end of that cycle, you can treat again. You can just keep doing it. So, and, and the goal is to really kind of convert the cancer into something that's just essentially you just give a little therapy, knock it down, and draw the therapy, and wait for it to come back, knock it down again. And, um, and so uh, the idea is that you prolong life, you are giving nowhere near um, the, the kind of the, the amount of treatment would have at, at maximum power rate dose. So the patients have fairly prolonged periods of time where they uh, are not under treatment. Um, and, and that can range from four months to a year and a half. So the benefits can actually vary quite a bit. Um, and um, so, so we've started that with uh, the, uh, an initial trial that, that's, um, that's gone quite well, actually. It's uh, we're just just reporting the results of it now. We we so the we have a, we had a group of men that had the standard therapy where they just got maximum tolerated dose. Um, they progressed after fourteen and three months. The other group, the median time to progression was thirty point four months. So it's a sixteen months difference, um, and they received only forty one percent of the drug. Mm. Now, Everadone doesn't um, is not terribly toxic, um, but it does have what's called financial toxicity. Now it's about six thousand dollars a month ah. for, for treatment. Um, of course, a whole other issue with uh, with, with the uh, pharma 
but but in any case, uh, they appreciated the fact that they didn't have to uh, have therapy and didn't have to pay for therapy. Um, the interesting thing is that because there was a mathematical model that was um, that was um, uh, part of this, part of the design, we could analyze the uh, the results. And what we found was, oddly enough, the 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 most important um, result I think of this trial is the number seven. Hmm. Uh, and it's a very nerdy reason for that. I like that uh, number. They, they, it turns out that the the, the, the the fitness difference between the sensitive cells and, and resistant cells. So the resistant cells have the burden of some kind of resistance mechanism, which is hmm. favorable to them in the presence of therapy, but unfavorable to them in the absence of therapy. And we had assumed that that this the ratio of this, and, and, and again, this is part of the, this is just a parameter, but it's based on that in, on that relative fitness. That that would be between two or three. It turns out the number is seven. Um, hmm. Now that's important because what that means is that what we had thought was that whenever the whenever you take the the, the, the um, therapy away and the sensitive cells start to grow up, that we would. We would just keep the resistance cells flat, so that what what we would have is this: we would walk, get uh, get stay flat. When, when we treated, we would walk again, and just keep going up, so that eventually we would get to a point where you always fail. Uh, and so it was, we we felt that this is not a uh, um, there's a there's some end point to this therapy. But if it's seven, it doesn't just they stay flat. In fact, the population goes down. Hmm. The, you, you, you are actively reducing the population of the resistant cells. And what we showed was that over three to four cycles, if we could keep that, that, that precisely kind of timed um, um, variation in, in, you know, on off therapy, that we could actually uh, um, reduce, the, reduce the population to somewhere near extinction. Mm. Now that's a, that's a whole that that brings entirely different dynamics to yep. and and that would be um, then something that would, would be we could use that strategy for very prolonged uh, persistence. Um, now it turns out there are four patients on our trial that are still on abiraterone for almost after about five years, which is never mm. heard of amount of time, and all of them appear to have had that dynamic. And it's not just a theoretical thing. We appear to have seen that phenomenon. In some of the patients that we, they just happened to hit the sweet spot. Yep. And what the math model says is that we could actually hit that sweet spot. We could have hit that sweet spot in every man in the protocol. We just didn't. We were using the wrong um, bound. So, for, so um, this has been a, um, quite eye-opening. Um, if it ever gets published, it'll be nice to to accept it. So, but the other then the Heath hand is about extinction, which is arguably what you want to do with cancer therapy. I mean, cancer therapy is about extinction yep. of cancer population. Now, whenever we think about extinctions, we always think about the dinosaurs, um, and the dinosaur extinction is very dramatic. It's one cause, one event. Meter hit, dinosaurs were wiped out. It's probably Significantly more complex than that, but at least in, 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 kind of in summary, it's a one of a uh, thing. Uh, but most extinctions are what are called background extinctions, meaning that they are species specific. They occur at a rate maybe five per year. But in the Anthropocene era, our era, meaning that humans are beginning to go off other species, mm -hmm. um, as terrible as that is, it has given us an opportunity to. Uh, study in detail a, uh, an, an extinction, a background extinction, while it's happening, or at least after it's happened, or in retrospect, we, can, we have more data, we have more, more observations. And so the ethan is an example of that. Um, ethan was uh, uh, quite numerous on the board uh, when the European settlers arrived. Um, the settlers began to hunt them, um, as you said there. <laughs> Uh, they may have been the, the actual turkey at the first um, Thanksgiving dinner. Apparently, they weren't that good. I'm, I'm told that 
like the, the well-to-do people like Ben Franklin would never meet me. It's, uh, <laughs> it was kind of a, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the analogy would be, but it was um, extensively hunted. And then as the um, cities grew, uh, their habitat was increasingly encroached upon. And so finally in the, uh, the mid 19th century, there was only a small population of them left in Martha's Vineyard. They, they, I think there were about 50 birds. They were, that was the surviving population. And the people there decided to, uh, to conserve them. Um, and so they, they, they protected and, and their, their habitat was uh, plated. And um, it grew to about 2,000. Um, but then a sequence of events occurred they, that were just sort of random. Um, there was a fire that, that occurred in their habitat. There were a couple of harsh winters that, that were back to back. There was an inadvertent uh, uh, um, a, a development of a, a, some kind of, a, of a infection. And by, I think it's about 1935, the last of them died. Um, and this exhibits crit critical dynamics of um, background um, Start with with first strike, meaning that in this case it was the hunting and the habitat encroachment took a large and dispersed and population, and you reduced it to a small population that is typically fragmented into small areas. Um, that small population then um, is typically uh, resistant to whatever that first strike was. Um, in, in, in effect, it's sort of a selection for resistance. But it's highly vulnerable to extinction because of unique properties of small populations. They have, uh, they're, they're like any small population, they're um, unusually vulnerable to stochastic changes, meaning random variations in their birth and death rate, which cause them just to go just by random. Um, but they're also called the LE effects, meaning that they, that, that groups of, of animals tend to have a higher birth rate as the population increases, um, and there's a number of reasons for that, but, but those render them vulnerable to small perturbations uh, mm -hmm. that are often stochastic. And so in this case, the small population, even if it was being conserved by the humans, was just subject to these, these little things that would have never affected the large population, yep. but they went extinct. And, and so this idea is, what, what to me is very interesting is that, um, is that Anthropocene extinctions are typically caused by a sequence of perturbations, a sequence of insults to the population, none of which by itself could cause extinction, sequence of things. And so when we think about curing cancer, you know, we tend to take the, uh, the, the dinosaur approach. You know, let's, let's massively apply this, this, this perturbation. And the problem uh, with this, like the, like the impact that killed the dinosaurs, you know, it killed. It also killed sixty percent of the of the land. Um, it's indiscriminate, and so when we apply these huge forces, massive chemotherapy, you know, just short of killing someone, we're always limited by the fact that we're going to pull off normal cells. You know, as long as the cancer cells are just you know a little bit less sensitive than the most sensitive, you know, or than normal cells, they'll be okay. Um, so. Um, and we haven't, I mean, we, you know, we can get really good uh, results, like the first strike. We can, we can knock these populations way down. But what we do is you keep applying the first strike. And so rather than changing to second strike agents, second strikes are almost always different from the first strike. Um, and uh, so, so even if we don't have a cure for cancer, you know, we always talk about the cure for cancer. Mm -hmm. for as though it was a thing. But a cure for cancer may be simply a strategy. Um, we may have, we may be able to take, we may not have a cure for cancer, but we may be able to put together a string of treatments, none of which could cure the cancer by itself, but mm -hmm. by, by combining them strategically, we might be able to eradicate. And, and so this brought, so this is um, a, a second kind of extinction strategy uh, you know, propose that rather than trying to get, get this magic bolt about kill the cancer cells mm -hmm. and, uh, and and spare the normal cells, and there may be such things. 
but, but we clearly don't have them now. But that, I'm not sure that that means that we can't cure the cancers. I think that we would, we would in fact have the potential to do that by harnessing the dynamics of anthropocene extinction rather than thinking in terms of the numbers. So, <laughs> sorry, that was a long answer. But, no, no, yeah. it, it, it was great. To be, fair, <laughs> to be fair, there were two questions there. So. No, that, 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 <laughs> it, it was awesome. And it, it's, yeah. uh, you know, an, another uh, fascinating way to think about um, these strategies, and and and, and as you, with your with your study, the fact that you're seeing the translational, uh, the initial translational success of this, it's uh, it's it's just very very cool <laughs> um, that you're seeing it work. Um, what one other area that you know I wanted to touch on, of course, uh, especially the beginning, um, is your interest in, in so-called information theory of living systems. Uh, you, you have this fascinating review re from recently, Information Theory and Living Systems, Method Applications and Challenges. Um, and you mentioned in this uh, paper, the, you know, this concept of non-traditional information storage in biologic systems. And, and, you, and you refer to areas like um, Mem uh, transmembrane flow of ions and information storage and lipids and uh, the cytoskeleton of cells. Uh, you and I, you know, offline, we're talking a little bit about Mike Levin's work. And, and once again, you know, uh, genes are great, but there's all this other stuff, uh, information, we'll call it, flowing around that dictates, you know, what's happening with these genes. Uh, also makes me think of, you know, your old stomping grounds at Fox Chase and sort of the, the work of Beatrice Mitz uh, back in the days in terms of uh, embryonic uh, sort of normalization of cells. Uh, talk just a little bit, if you would, about uh, this concept of information theory and sort of how we should be looking at more of these non-traditional areas in information in the body for uh, biologic purposes. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that if you go back um, into the 1950s, um, a Yale math, a bio, biophysicist, I believe, uh, named Moskowitz, um, calculated the amount of information in an E. coli. Um, and um, you can do that in a number of different ways. Uh, but at the time, we didn't know what the information content of the genome was. Mm -hmm. Now we know that. And the amount of information is five orders of magnitude too low. It's, it's in the genome. It's five orders of magnitude lower than the information content of the cell. Um, you can then play around with that and say, well, let's add every mRNA, let's add every protein, let's call that genetic information. Yep. And you're still off by two orders. Um, so, so the genome and its products, and again, this is just a back of the envelope cal calculation arithmetic, um, still only account for about 1% of the information yeah. of the cell. Now, you can you can sort of juggle that around a little bit and say maybe it was 5%, maybe 20%, but it's sort of for sure not 100%. Right. Now, that doesn't, you know, in, in that that sounds like heresy in, in classic biology, but in fact, um, it's really pretty easy. If you just think about how you calculate information using pan and entropy, for example, uh, in non so if there's something that's different across a barrier, so in this case, you take the cell membrane and there's enormous uh, gradients of ions across the cell membrane. Um, and in fact, uh, about 30 or 40% of the cell's energy budget is used to make those gradients. Um, now, you can calculate that, there's, that actually comes very close to the information content of E. coli. Um, and if you calculate that, now you then have membrane itself has tremendous order and um, a, a number of different uh, phases that it can be in, so there's a lot of information in that. The, uh, and, so, and there's no encoding of that in, in the genome. So, so the, 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 uh, the uh, ion pumps are encoded in the genome, but they act like, um, like Maxwell's demons kinds of things. They, they're, they're using information from the, from the genome to create this large transmembrane gradient. Um, so why does, the, why does the cell spend so much of its energy generating this transmembrane gradient? And, and this is like, uh, you know, they always, like with water, you follow the money. I think in biology, you follow the energy because um, 
evolution is a constant optimization process. So it's not you, you're not going to spend energy on something that you don't use. Uh, classically, for example, the cave fish need their eyes, um, and Darwin found that puzzling. Why you know they don't do anything, you don't need them, but why would you lose them? And, and the reason is that they lose them because they cost something, they cost uh, energy, they cost resources. And so, uh, again, that optimization process simply gets rid of them. So if, we're spend, if, if our cells are spending that much energy on, the, on generating this membrane gradient, which contains enormous amounts of information, that must be hugely important to the, um, the cell. And then, you know, just think about yourself. I mean, we always talk about the, the, the nucleus as being the head of the cell or the, the central processor or the center of the cell. It seems to be our anthropomorphic view of, of the nucleus. But, you know, if you picture yourself sitting in the cell, and how would you know what's going on around you? Uh, I mean, where is the spatial and temporal information coming from? Because... Right now, they, they, you know, the classic thing is that there's ligands binding on the cell membrane. They give rise to things like the MAPK pathway, these production proteins. But the standard dogma is that they diffuse through the, through the cell membrane. Now, they, if you look at the way this is typically put into books, they, they make these the proteins look real big. And the distance between the cell membrane and nuclear membrane look real small. Yeah. So there's like three of them. But the fact is, it's about a thousand protein diameters between the cell membrane and the nuclear membrane, and it's a three-dimensional structure. So yeah. they're going in all direction. And you know, a famous ma a Yale mathematician said, "A drunk man will be found will find his way home, but a drunken bird will be lost forever," <laughs> because three-dimensional diffusion is really a big problem. And so, um, so you're sitting there. The only information you're getting is from these diffusing proteins. You don't know anything about time or space. You know all that information is being degraded. You know, so if you're, if I'm, uh, you know, a, a, a potentially you know juicy single cell eukaryote sitting in a pond, and I've got a predator to my right, you know, I need to go left. But if I don't know that the predator is to my right, I, I you know, I, I got to know that. And so, how do I know that if I'm sitting in the command center of the nucleus? And I'm not getting information about spatial and temporal um, uh, uh, factors and threats. Or if I want to, you know, pivot in one direction to find, you know, so, so there's some food over here. You know, how do I know that it's there? And how do I know which way to go? Um, and so I what I think is that we tend to forget that the only way that you can get spatial and temporal information is at the cell membrane. And so... My model of this is that there are lots of um, pro pore uh, on the cell membrane that are linked to various um, receptor membrane, uh, receptor proteins. And so what happens is that when the receptor binds to the pore, it opens, you get a flow of ions across the, um, this, the pore along the transmembrane gradient. Mm -hmm. So you get uh, brief transitions of different ion concentrations in the cytoplasm adjacent to this core. What, what, what people don't know is that many proteins are highly sensitive to local sodium and potassium concentration. So what you can do is turn on and turn off enzymes uh, and you can move uh, proteins you know, in or out of the region. Um, and, and, so, and, they, and they can respond locally. Now you can also then get broader as, as the just a single Prick kind of thing. That's one thing. But if it's if you're pushing on the whole cell, you know, all of these are being, uh, you know, times you get a much broader signal. But you but you can start to then see, of course, that signal will dissipate very quickly because the it, once the pore closes, the ions will come back to the to what they were normally. Um, but it's and, and that can be very quick. But you can get these very rapid local responses to perturbations at the cell membrane. And those kinds of things then can be translated to the rest of the cell. So I, I'm, I kind of view the cell as more of a distributive system of, of information dynamics, rather than the nucleus as a, as a um, processor, because it's too fast, it's too, it, you can't do it fast enough. You, you know, you've got a, a protein has to go from there to the nucleus, it has to find its target in the, 
you know, on the chromosomes, and a very non-trivial task, by the way. And then it has to respond and has to send proteins back to that location. I mean, it just, it's inconceivable to me that that, that could actually be done. So, so I think that we've, you know, again, the, it's, it's so easy to study the genes now. You just, you know, you grind up the cell and put it in a machine and out comes, you know, tons and tons of data. Uh, but I, but I think that again, we, it's, it's that the old um, uh, uh, joke about the drunk that, that lost his keys and um, he was before the one light and someone tried to help him and you know finally the guy said, well, where did you lose? Them? And he said, oh, you know, across the street and you know, why are you looking here? Because the lights, you know, that kind of. Um, so I think you have that kind of fact that we can do it. We can study these. It's easy to do. Um, it doesn't really take a lot of thought. You know, honestly, I mean, you know, we can generate data, but I don't, but I'm not sure that we've, I, I think that we've kind of gone off into left field. We, we lost a kind of coherence, uh, a, a sort of community uh, of, of, of the cell, which more existed in the 50s, you know, when we didn't have this wonderful technology. The technology has been great, but in some ways it's also been that, that light on the opposite side of the road uh, that's distracted us from from some of the broader issues again my apologies no 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 the, the, no need to apologize uh it it, it was you know, spot on i mean I, I i followed everything you said and it's um it's uh clearly especially what you're mentioning sort of that uh, pre uh, molecular biology days that hey a, a lot of stuff happened we, we we learned a lot about things the, the larger systems back then that we just seem to have forgotten, but it's nice yeah. that they're coming back into into vogue. Um, there's, a, there's a great story, you know, that it, it, it was. I think it was called the gene pool. Uh, that that about the time the gene, the human genome was being decoded, uh, a group of scientists got together and they did a vetting pool where they you could put in the number of genes that you thought were going to be in the human genome, okay. and then the winner was going to be hot, um, and um, so the, the mean, uh, I think, was about 65, 67,000. Um, the highest was about 300,000. The lowest was about 27,000. And nobody won, basically, because the number is about 19,800. You know, we, we, we have gene envy now. We, 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 we you know, and, and it was just like humiliating. You know, the, the um, mouse has more genes than you. Yeah. Um, and so it, maybe the complexity of a multicellular organism isn't fundamentally linked to the genes. Um, I mean, to me, that's the obvious conclusion from that. And yet, the, the, what what we're doing is is sort of backward somersaults to say that our genes are better than their genes, our right. genes do more with less than their genes, or something. And I, I just, I always, I always think that's that's a great story. Yeah, uh, and it's really kind of embarrassing. I'm glad I wasn't part of that genome you know, that, that contest, but. But it does, I think, speak to our um, something. Or right, what? Um, you know, a, a couple uh, about a month ago now, um, talked to Azra Raz up in uh, Columbia. Mm -hmm. uh, since then, uh, the new paper came out in Scientific American, which you are one of the uh, many of the. Uh, folks that have signed on to uh, we must find ways to detect cancer much earlier um, using uh, tools like you've developed in terms of the integrated mathematical models uh, and, and some of your other thinking in terms of uh, cancer evolution and extinction and so forth any interesting uh, insights related or well, you can talk about the paper for a minute but also uh, to how some of these tools can be used as I like to look at sort of the very, yeah. very early transformations. Yeah, I, you know, I, it's still, I, I think, uh, um, you know, we just simply don't have the technology to find these right now. And, and um, the, you know, the problem with, I mean, this, this has been a theme for, for as long as I've been involved in working in cancer. Um, you know, we need to find them earlier and detect them earlier and, and yet, you know, screening studies have uh, yielded their own set of, of uh, problems. You know, is it really, do we do really, you know, improve the outcomes and, and so forth? So it's, it's complicated. I do think that uh, one of the things we should be thinking about is how we can eradicate small cancer populations. 
again, using the vulnerability of small populations to extinction. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we know that, that, that they, the small cancer populations do occur and they do seem to spontaneously resolve. I mean, you can't really quantify that in any means, but there's, I think, sufficient evidence to support it. And then, and is there something that we can do to um, enhance the probability of, uh, of um, uh, ancient, either by manipulating the demographic or the environment? Um, personally, I mean, my, my own personal view is that um, you don't have to be, this doesn't have to be a fancy medicine. Um, and this could be um, exercise. So mm -hmm. that when you exercise, you know, people always talk about the immune system as being, uh, you know, sort of up in some odd, on nonspecific way by exercise. But what we sure what you do do is that you create a transient um, acidosis in your blood. I mean, you, you, yeah. your blood pH goes down. And one of the things that we know from from the modeling, well, cancers are often pretty acidic to begin with, but they're vulnerable to rapid declines in uh, in, in uh, pH because okay. the their their pH is determined by the uh, by the by the concentration gradient across the blood across the blood vessel. So it has to go out. So if you make the acid concentration higher in the blood vessel, you get less flow out of the tumor, and the tumor can become very acidic, and actually you can cause you know, death. Now I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm, I'm just saying that these, you know, you don't have to do anything really fancy to, or, or let's say you can do common sense things. Yep. Um, and, it, it, and it's possible that you're, what, we're, what you're doing with how you exercise is that you are um, suppressing the growth, at least of some cancer cells. You know, I think there's good data in like breast cancer, for example, that, uh, right, that exercise regularly um, have, have a lower incidence of breast cancer. And there's also some, I think, reasonable evidence to suggest that if you are a cancer patient and you're treated for cancer, that if you can maintain an exercise level that's, that's relatively high as best you can, that you, you, um, you know, those are easy sort of common sense things uh, that, that we can all do that I think would help us uh, reduce the probability of, of getting cancer. Uh, and my guess is there are many other things Certainly, you know, exercise is a reasonable um, thing anyway, I suppose. So. And, um, yeah, and that, that inflammation as well, it seems to be, it seems to be everywhere <laughs> yeah, nowadays. Yeah, an aspirin a day, you know, doesn't hurt. I mean, I yeah. think those are things that make sense, not too expensive, you know, no real toxicity. Yep. Yep. Toxicity. Robert. Um, that makes that to me that makes sense, um, Robert. It's um, it's it's really it's refreshing. It's uh, very inspiring hearing your story and that uh, there are uh, champions like you that are out there uh, with these concepts that haven't forgotten their history, mm -hmm. <laughs> whether it be about cancer or about the heat hen, mm -hmm. um, and, and just you know really. Uh, wishing you the best with these programs and their translation moving forward. Um, for everybody that's going to be listening to this episode uh, or, or watching on the podcast uh, on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Dr. Robert Gattenby, Chairman of the Department of Radiology at the H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center, Co-Director of the Cancer Biology and Evolution Program, doing really fascinating things with integrative mathematical oncology, adaptive therapy and tumor extinction, and a fascinating theory of information flow in living systems. Uh, really amazing stuff. Um, Robert, thank you for taking the time out of the schedule to, to come and talk to us and educate us for a while about these things. Um, thank you for doing them. Uh, and at this, you know, as we say, thank you for trying to make the world a better place and creating a better tomorrow for all of us through your work. Uh, it's really very inspiring and wishing you the best with it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for reading those articles. Other than my mother, I don't think you, I think you're the only person that, you know, has read them. <laughs> I think it's good. They're good. They're very good. They're very it's good stuff. It's good for me. <laughs>